toi. <laughs> Yay! Welcome, friends. Welcome and welcome. I wish you were here. I can't wait for, <laughs> I guess you are here. I wish Zoom would <laughs> get their scratch and sniff together already. <laughs> this catnip here in my hands is so heavenly. And I'm so grateful that we get to spend the next hour of our lives just talking about catnip together. And as you come in, please introduce yourselves in the chat, share your name, share where you're from, share especially where you're from. If you know the indigenous lands who you occupy, I'm Petra standing here, sitting here on Haudenosaunee Seneca land, southern edge of Canandaigua Lake here in the Finger Lakes of New York. Oh, but don't let me get ahead of myself, friends. Please join us in the chat and also join us on video if you feel so inspired. We love to see all of your faces and rather than little rectangles within larger rectangles, it's lovely to see our faces and I love picturing them in a circle. Like we are all together and in fact, we are. And without further ado, let's give thanks. I would love to thank Geraldine <laughs> for joining me on this journey <laughs> and also Kira for interpreting along the way. Thank you, Kira, for your joy and language justice. Thank you also to our families, our friends, our teams at Suntrap Botanical with Geraldine, Pure Fruition Seeds. There are so many humans that make it possible for <laughs> me to <laughs> say hello vaguely with a smile on my face, <laughs> having fed myself at some decent time in the recent past. So thank you to all the humans who bring us all here and to the ancestors, both plant and human, who have shared seeds of biology as well as wisdom and wonder with us and shared with so much generosity, everything that we now think we know and might one day become. So thank you also for everyone joining us live. It's way more fun to be in community and have these conversations <laughs> together. And also thank you anyone who's listening to the recording. I look so forward to connecting with all of us again and again and again. And before we dive a little deeper, I'd love to share this quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer to ground us in our time together. These are some words from her luminous essay, The Service Berry. And quick check in service berries, marvelous trees, native. Think beautiful little apples that are so sweet covering trees in June, covered in cedar wax wings and all manner of life, savoring so much abundance. So from her essay, The Service Berry, these words from Robin Walkimer. I think that the service berries show us another model, one based upon reciprocity rather than accumulation, where wealth and security come from the quality of your relationships, not from the illusion of self-sufficiency. Without gift relationships with birds and bees, service berries would disappear from the planet. Even if they hoarded abundance perching atop the wealth ladder, they would not save themselves from the fate of extinction if their partners did not share in that same abundance. Hoarding won't save us either. All flourishing is mutual. In the spirit of all flourishing and the mutuality of all of these things, welcome friends. And without further ado, Geraldine, who are you? <laughs> Hello, thank you for um, that beautiful welcome, um, Petra. It's so nice to get grounded here with you and with everybody else. And yes, I am Geraldine. I grow herbs and flowers in um, Brookdendale, which is unceded Haudenosaunee land. 
And um, I'm really curious, somebody named Becky Fry in the comments wrote, they're from Cortland, New York, and they grow wholesale herbs and love the catnip. Hey, go ahead and drop. If you have a company, I'm always looking for local people growing wholesale herbs because I can't seem to grow enough for my company, Sun Trap Botanical. Um, so go ahead, a little invitation to plug yourself. Um, I make all kinds of bioregional herbalism um, manner of products. And I have an online course called Bioregional Herbalism and Medicine Making. And it's my favorite thing to talk about it with people. So this monthly chat is an absolute dream. And I want to invite everybody to be super friendly in the comments. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I wanna hear all of them. So with no further ado, let us get into catnip. Yes. <laughs> so let's get into it, friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Petra here at Fruition Seeds, sending love from one of our high tunnels. I've recently come to realize, P.S., by the way, that I'm actually a flower farmer. <laughs> These are easily 10,000 <laughs> watermelon radish flowers that are quickly becoming seeds. Um, so I'm really excited and so passionate about organic, regionally adapted seeds and sharing them. And it doesn't really matter, you know, if you have seeds, if you don't know how to grow them. So it's a huge joy to share with you a few details on how you can grow catnip and so many other things. And without further ado, let's talk about perennial psychology because yes, this beautiful catnip is in fact a perennial. In fact, I didn't plant this. My dear friend, John Brown planted it when he was about eight years old is his best guess. And he's 92 and it's currently growing on the edge of his barn in the shade undaunted. So yes, let's talk about perennial psychology. So slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> Maybe not every time, but a lot of the time. And that is the race that perennials play. In the tortoise and hare equation, annuals are the hare and perennials are the tortoise. Their seeds generally are smaller than many annuals. There are definitely exceptions, but as a general rule, Perennial seeds are quite tiny and they're also taking much longer to germinate and also their leaves when they emerge are smaller and take longer to grow. And so this is just a little bit of the way where all the annuals, they're just off to the races going to make the, all of their seed in one year where the perennials take their time and bide their time and by growing deep tap roots and nice steady leaves, they find their way to making many seeds over many, many, many years. So that being said, let's now talk a little bit about planning, then sowing tips, then transplanting tips, tips for catnip and containers, and then dividing. So quickly, some tips on planning out catnip in your life. So plan on having it for many seasons and only harvesting as a general rule, no more than say 15, 20% in the, of the leaves in that first year. You want that first year to just be giving them all the kinds of tender, loving care, fertility, water, attention that you can be giving them. So they're as big and beautiful as possible. After that, you can kind of walk away. <laughs> and that's not entirely true, but certainly in the case of catnip, it pretty much is. Well-established catnip is honestly going to be a nuisance potentially in your life. We'll talk about how to manage <laughs> catnip um, in your life some, very, very soon. But yeah, know that all of that care, you're front-loading in that first season to establish. So just plan on that from the very beginning. And plant on, plan on planting it out after first frost. So even though it's incredibly cold hardy, you will see after the snow melts, after your catnip has established, it's growing. Your snowdrops are starting to come up. Your crocus are starting to come up. Your catnip is already eight inches tall. <laughs> catnip is unbelievably cold hardy. That being said, first year establishing, plant it after frost. So it's just easy peasy to establish. Also plan on 
knowing that catnip just kind of is in the mint family, take a look at this square stem and a lot of things in the mint family just kind of take over really fast. There's some quality exceptions without question. <laughs> exceptions without question. That's such a great phrase. But catnip is not one of them. Catnip, mint, spearmint, just lemon balm, watch out. Don't plant. They're fabulous companion plants, yes, but not because you plant them adjacent and then they're like good neighbors. Plant them in a container close by other plants and they will have all of those amazing companion plant capacities but they really take over quickly and they are not the easiest to manage so mint is like off the charts in this department but honestly catnip is a bit in that department too and so I always encourage people honestly our catnip is in a hedgerow <laughs> like not on a, in a fence not next to anything that we have to weed or otherwise care for <laughs> and she just takes care of herself gloriously so plan on planting your catnip either in a container or in a hedgerow not adjacent to your vegetables and ideally even other perennial herbs. She's tall enough and will take over enough that after that first year, you'll likely wish she had us, <laughs> her own kingdom, queendom all to herself. Also, I just love plan on mulching. Mulching is an amazing way to establish lots of perennials in their first year. So, and just plan on giving her more light if you want to establish more quickly and have more leaves. So there's a few keys on planning just up front. Now let's talk about sewing and this is the hard part. So here's the thing. So many perennials, catnip included, so resilient. They are so challenging often to start from seed. And with many of them, like if you are anywhere close by, just come with a shovel. <laughs> I'll give you plenty of catnip. They're very easy to divide and propagate vegetatively, clonally. But if you're starting them from seed, again, they're small seeds. They take their time germinating. Their leaves are small. So they kind of just are more challenging than a lot of other seeds, certainly annuals. Um, to be establishing. So I like to start them about five, six weeks before final frost and on a heat mat. And in mini blocks are the best. These lovely little mini blockers are amazing. Push them all kinds of soil in there and then they push out. And then you have these lovely tiny little universes that you've started. You've put just one seed in the top and whoa, Petra, catnip and like oregano so many perennials have the tiniest seeds get a toothpick and wet the toothpick I wet it on the tip of my tongue many people are like wait 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 blah, blah, blah. and so just get a glass of water then whatever you need to do moisten the tip of that toothpick and then just pick up effortlessly one seed at a time. If you want to do three, you got that option. And it's remarkably easy with that tiny little toothpick. So from there, you can just, once you've made your soil blocks, pop them out, take that toothpick and just swivel it, roll it ever so slightly onto the tip of that soil block. And bam, it's really easy to get one, two seeds per soil block. And that is, then these soil blocks are just a half inch above your heat mat, as opposed to two inches for a regular soil block or a cell tray, a six pack. So the closer your seeds are to that heat mat, the more quickly they'll germinate. So that's true, whatever seed you've got, but especially for perennials and also for like solanids, whether it's peppers, eggplants, tomatoes, they, the closer they are to that heat mat, the more quickly they will germinate. And so as soon as, I mean, this is not a lot of soil in there, tiny mini blocks, there's miniature indeed. So as soon as you see those leaves emerge, pop them up, whether it's into a large soil block that you've got, or if you want to then pop them up into a six pack or anything else that you've got, yogurt cups, amazing. I love you. <laughs> You've got all these options, but once those cotyledons emerge from the mini blocker, that's when you want to pot them up. And generally, even though generally six, eight week old transplants, we are generally, they're in like four inch pots or larger by the time we're actually planting them out after frost. 
because catnip does grow really quickly compared to most other perennials, but we find that they don't grow that, they still grow more slowly. So we're not needing to pot them up really beyond that two inch soil block or just standard cell, tra cell tray size. So then when you are feeding them, just a quick note, don't skimp on your potting mix. People so often want to know what, how can they be feeding their seedlings? And I'm like, really? You barely need to if your potting mix is the highest quality, most nutrient dense that you can find. So there's, of course, so much more to share. Check out our free Seed Starting Academy, which is an awesome online course that we made totally free at the beginning of the pandemic. And you can also download our Rise and Shine Starting Seeds with Ease book that has tons of this info and then some on perennials, annuals, direct sow, transplant. And it's a beautiful book you can get on our website. You can also download the free ebook on our website as well. So there's so much more to share in all of these departments, but here's a few notes on transplanting your catnip. So like all transplants, we harden them off, acclimate them to life outside because it's kind of different in your garden compared to your kitchen or your greenhouse or wherever you're starting your seeds. So hardening off, acclimating those seedlings for at least four, if not five days um, after final frost is this wonderful way to get them. My Polish nose loves to burn and so can your baby catnip seedlings. So harden them off, yes. And as you're planting them, water them with fish emulsion. I love water them, yes, but if you can add nutrients, bonus. You probably hike up a mountain with snacks in your bag <laughs> and please do this. <laughs> yeah, give your plants plenty of snacks. They are totally climbing a mountain. <laughs> so water helps all of those roots and soil stay cohesively together and transplant more seamlessly. And then when they get there, they have everything they need to be like, yes, oh, shall we explore over here? And then that food that whether it's compost tea, uh, water, <laughs> worm casting tea or fish emulsion, all amazing tools to just give them snacks to inspire even greater growth. And especially with any transplant, but especially with perennials, I love to tuck compost and slow release organic fertilizer in that hole as you're planting them. Just as like, if you're gonna climb a serious mountain, don't take just one sandwich, take two. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, another thought, this catnip, like I mentioned, grows on the side of a very shady barn. That being said, it could be five times the size, both in height and in just number of stems, if it had more sun. So here's a general rule. Plants need sun. <laughs> Who knew? Plants photosize, photosynthesize. They make sugars from sunlight. Amazing. And if they have more sun, they can make more leaves. And the more sun they have, the more the leaves make more sugars than they need. So they can put more energy into flowering and fruiting. And so if you want to be growing more leaves certain, or more flowers, more sun, the merrier. But even though a, a, because we're predominantly just harvesting catnip for the leaf, we're sure that we can just, sometimes we put them in some shady spots or some partially sunny spots um, just to see like, there you go, have this wonderful little pocket of catnip and they might not be as big and robust as they could be, but no, they can totally hack the partial shade as well. So, oh my gosh, anything else did I mention? don't plant them in your vegetable garden as best you can. Put them in a container, put them in a hedgerow. So let's talk about containers. Bigger is better always with container gardening. Bigger is better is a phrase I absolutely abhor, but when it comes to <laughs> container gardening, <laughs> it just is the best way to say it. <laughs> no matter how big your container is, it's still a thimble of soil compared to the access your plants would have to in a larger like, garden context. So bigger is better. I recommend 10 gallons minimum for a big glorious, especially perennial to thrive. 
just be sure that you're adding that slow release organic fertilizer and compost into every square inch of that container so that those roots are inspired to enjoy every square inch of that container. If you're interested in container gardening, PS, by the way, we have another free online course, um, our eight keys of container gardening. <laughs> and there's so much more to share. And we do <laughs> check out that little mini course, friends. And yeah, just the name of the game here with, with the catnip in containers is you really want to contain your catnip. It so quickly goes a little wild and you don't want it to outcompete any of your vegetables, flowers, other herbs. So giving it its own little universe to grow in is marvelous. And you can certainly save its seeds. They're very easy. I, in fact, as I was harvesting this fresh catnip, look at this beautiful stem from last year. So they grow um, these beautiful stems. You can see the squareness. You can see that mint family from a mile away. And it still smells like catnip, it's amazing. So yes, it's very easy to save the seeds. There are in fact a few seeds still here now in my hand that are haven't been let go of. That being said, it's best to harvest the seeds for the highest quality and quantity seeds. Once you start to see these green flowers, green and white flowers turn to gold, that is the prime time. And also, did I mention? seeds of perennials are challenging to start so resilient once established so they grow really quickly especially things like if they're happy healthy and they're catnip <laughs> so after three years you can totally just take a sharp shovel and slice a portion of them off and they are so easy to divide either first thing in spring just as they're coming back to life or in fall as they're going dormant so just some quick little fast facts on how to grow catnip friends and now i would love 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 to hand it off to Geraldine and a quick little reminder that ask any question anytime, drop them in the chat. We'll have plenty of time at the end for some Q&A and conversation. So Geraldine, I'm ready to take notes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for that. I love learning from you so much, Petra. And I loved the analogies that you shared and the um, the snacks. I'm going to fertilize my garden so much more this year thinking about that. So thank you. We all needed it. We all needed to hear that. And I am sincerely so excited to talk about catnip. It's one of my favorite herbs. Uh, where do I dive right in? Well, let's start with the Latin name, Napita cataria. We all know it's good for cats. And since this is one of my um, favorite herbs, to use in my apothecary. I briefly, a few years ago, would strictly refer to it as Napita because I got so tired of every client and family member and friend just bulking when I handed them a tincture or a tea and the first ingredient was catnip. They were like, Has, have, you, have you lost your, you want me to take catnip? And here's the thing, it does make cats crazy, but it has all kinds of incredible effects on humans as well. So if you are to taste a fresh extract of catnip or you know the dried leaf in tea, what you might notice right away is that it's kind of a pungent taste. It's like mildly acrid. And we know when we're, uh, the tastes of plants tell us things. And so that acrid flavor pungent, it's a little bit, um, you know, more rare in our medicines. And it usually means that there is some kind of antispasmodic property. And that is one of my favorite properties of catnip, this gentle antispasmodic ac action. And so when I learned about that specific action at herb school, I was interested. And so I waited, um, you know, to use it several times, I wanted to test its efficacy. So one time I had woken up in the morning and on an empty stomach, I drank a cup of black tea just very quickly. I was then going to talk to one of my teachers in the apothecary lab and I got those um, sharp pains in my intestines. You know, like 
terrible gas pains where you just did something kind of stupid, like drank a really tannic rich beverage on an empty stomach. You know, like I, I knew that wasn't going to be good for my tummy, did it anyway. And I got really sharp pains in my stomach. And so my teacher immediately said, oh, I have a fresh extract of catnip. We're going to put um, five dropperfuls, it's kind of a lot, that's five milliliters of this fresh extract in a glass of water. Drink this, you'll be okay. I drank it. Um, and then it wasn't, I wasn't feeling better. So in five minutes, she gave me another glass with five dropperfuls in it. And five minutes after that, my intestinal um, cramp had just totally stopped seizing up. My pain was gone. And I was like, maybe there is something about this and spasmodic action. And later that month, I decided to test it again when I got a menstrual cramp. I thought like, has this anti-spasmodic action on the intestine? I saw like some writing um, that it has a similar effect on uterine spasm spasming. So I tried it again, again, success. So I got really excited at this point and I started making my own fresh extract and um, not only experimenting on myself, but giving it to friends. And um, I guess like that was 2016. So um, like five years later, it's one of the top selling tinctures in my apothecary store, cramp support. And the key herb is a fresh extract of catnip. And I've noticed that I seem to get the strongest tinctures from the plants growing in um, the roughest conditions. So like Petra said, it is, you know, happy plant when it establishes in your gardens. Like I, I see catnip coming all, coming up all over my garden. In fact, I've seen catnip growing out of cracks in a stone patio. And um, I tinctured that catnip and it made some of the most potent medicine. Like think about how much volatile oil, how many of those incredible medicinal compounds that catnip had to make to survive, you know? Rough conditions can make really strong medicine. That's certainly true with the herbal allies we harvest. So um, I've also seen catnip walking the trail to Taganic Falls, just growing out of the side of a rock wall. Catnip is very, um, you know, it, it likes to grow. It's like inspiring to me. And if you live in my neighborhood of Brooktondale by any chance, and you want catnip of your own, please feel free to come by with a shovel. I have so much more than I can handle and I would love to give you some um, or just buy some um, seeds from Petra and start them in your garden because it's a really fun ally to have with you. So let's talk a little bit more about catnip. Um, so native to Europe and it's a traditional European folk remedy. Um, I had known that, you know, it's like, I like to know where my plants are com coming from. I like to really grow a lot of native plants that um, are doing, you know, I like to steward native plants if I can, but there are definitely a lot of herbs that I want to have in my apothecary because I they work so well. Um, and catnip is one of those. So I knew it was native to Europe, but I hadn't really looked into it too much. So today I found a fun um, quote from, um, a paper written by an Australian institute um, quoting some 19th century European medicine book. And I'll just share that, this with you. During the 19th century, American physio-medical practitioner, practitioners used bowel injections of warm napita cataria infusions for intestinal flatulence. How do you like that? That's from the Southern Cross University in Australian, quoting um, H. Ward from 1936. A catnip tea enema, right? I mean, we know that the properties of this plant are aromatic, carminative, which means um, encouraging the release of, which can be, um, and not only does it release of flatulence, um, but it like helps your intestines not have so much. It's like, Okay, and it, it's also diaphoretic, nervine, and sedative, but usually a plant has many sedative, many um, properties, but it's got a really key one. So although it is an aromatic and a diaphoretic, which means it opens the pores and induces sweating, and a nervine, it calms the nerves, and it is a sedative, it 
can um, be a wonderful part of sleepy time blends. I would say if I had to choose like the strongest action it has, it's really that carminative, um, antispasmodic, helps you digest. It's just an ally to the intestinal system. Um, so here are some of my primary uses. I think of catnip automatically when I see digestive distress stemming from psychological stress. So chances are you or somebody you know has had stress-induced IBS. You know, just like, um, you all know what I'm talking about. Catnip is such a wonderful herb for anybody dealing with that, either as a fresh tincture um, in water, and um, I'll teach you how to make that in a minute, or as a dried leaf in tea. You're not necessarily needing that antispasmodic property there. It can be nice, but um, you do lose that antispasmodic property when you dry the leaves. So it's not, I wouldn't drink the tea to relieve a, a sharp cramp. Um, I would only take the fresh extract for that. And you could do that extract in alcohol or glycerin, either way, um, as long as it's that fresh leaf. But even for any kind of stress-induced IBS, the dried leaf tea could be just fine. Um, I've also seen indications in old herbals, which tend to have um, personalities, along with like helping you figure out who the herb is for. There were notes, many different notes of um, people like holding in stress and anxiety instead of expressing it. So, which is a direct contradiction of chamomile, which is a kind of similar herb, you know, I, I use in some similar formulas, um, but it's for the personality of chamomile is like when you just can't stop whining, it's just like you can't stop, you know, just like, oh, like, and sometimes that's really helpful. And like, I'm, I love whining, you know, sometimes you need to whine, it gets things done, squeaky wheel, right? Like you need to whine sometimes. Chamomile can help you when it becomes excessive. Catnip, on the other hand, <laughs> is for the person who might tend to internalize. And like, doesn't that make sense? Like if you're internalizing your stress and anxiety, you might get a tummy ache. You might get some digestive distress stemming from psychological stress. So that's a nice way to remember what catnip is good for. I think you just changed my life, Jill. <laughs> Project. <laughs> Let me know how it goes, Petra. I love, and that goes out to anybody. I love hearing personal experiences. This is like precious to any herbalist is specific indications. Like we eat them up, specific indications. Like the more specific, the better. And the more feedback, the better. And it doesn't have to be positive feedback. So feel free to write me if it's like, hey, it didn't work for me. That's good feedback. Send it along. So fresh leaf extract for sharp intestinal cramps. Um, but that, again, I just want to emphasize that if, if it's the dried leaf, it's not going to have that effect. And so if you are um, experience that sh experiencing that sharp cramp and you want to use catnip tincture this way, you're going to do... Um, you know, a large amount, like um, one to five dropperfuls. You can start with one um, and take like it in a full glass of water. I really don't take tinctures on the tongue that much. If you like to, that's great. I tend to have it in a little glass of water, just like tastes better to me. Um, I feel like it might be better for my throat too. So I'll take a little glass of water with the tincture diluted in water. And then I'll wait 10 to 15 minutes. And if that cramp has not subsided, you can go ahead and take it again, the same dose or slightly more up to like, um, you know, three times. If it's not working after three or four doses, maybe just um, try something else, try a different herb, try a different intervention. Um, but I usually find by the second or third dose, you're going to have some relief going on. Um, so I did mention that catnip is a diaphoretic, but it's an interesting diaphoretic. Um, some diaphoretics raise the body temperature while they open the pores and induce perspiration. Catnip doesn't really seem to raise the temperature too much. It just really opens that the pores and allows cooling. And because of that, um, it's great for breaking a fever. It can be really helpful um, for that. And it is so beloved 
for children. Catnip is like one of these herbs, like that when, when a kid is like feeling colicky or is sick, um, I think of catnip, chamomile and fennel. And they all mix together really beautifully um, to give to children. And never think that a gentle herb can't have profound effects. Um, sometimes the gentlest herbs taken as part of a daily regimen or you know, just even like for a couple of days can have a really profound effect on you. Catnip is not a um, herb that I would recommend taking every single day. Um, you know, it's, it's not that it's like, it's not like low dose botanical or anything, but it's not like an adaptogen or Tulsi or ashwagandha. Uh, it's not one that you would want to take every single day, but you could take it for a week. Like if you're taking a sleepy time blend to kind of like reset your sleep schedule, you know, feel free to take it every day for a week or so, but um, definitely you don't want to be taking it. Like I'll, you know, I'll take it for maybe a week as part of a menstrual formula, but after that, I'm not taking it every other day. Um, okay, so also like tea, bl tea blends, if you're making tea blends, colds, chills, congestion, sore throat, indigestion, I've put it in all of those blends combined with other herbs. And um, for colicky infants, even making just a weak tea of catnip, chamomile and fennel and just giving sips you know every like 15 minutes like a couple of sips can be really nice and gentle um i had a client who was on hormone replacement therapy going through a, a transition and i was looking for herbs to support this person and looking for you know wanting to have like a profound effect on the nervous system like a gently calming herb for some anxiety that was going on and catnip was the herb um, in the end that ended up really helping and we tried a couple different herbs so I just like to share that that um, it ended up having a profoundly um, calming and centering effect on this person so that's kind of a nice indication to share I like to share when herbs work and when they don't um, and it, again herbalists and specific indications it's a thing so before I tell you how to make medicine, um, oh, I, I do just like want to mention that catnip, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. But before I go into that, I want to tell you how to make that tincture since I've mentioned it a few times now. So if you have that beautiful fresh catnip that um, Petra was showing us, that bouquet of fresh leaves, I like to make catnip either when, when the flower is out um, just before flowering, or even when that flower is in bloom. Like I like to make it just before bloom or when it's in bloom. And I really value that fresh tincture. So I will do a ratio method of one to two, one part being the herb, two part being the menstruum. And then I blend it up in a blender. So say I had 100 grams of fresh catnip. I would put it on my scale, 100 grams of fresh catnip. I'm going to blend it in a blender with 200 milliliters of the highest proof alcohol I can get my hands on, which is usually 95%. And um, you can see like how beautiful and water filled that plant is that Petra's holding. It's like so much of its um, bodily content is water, like probably something like 70%. Um, and so that's going to add all the water you need in the tincture. You don't need to add any water or dilute the alcohol because that plant is holding all of the water for that the plant needs to extract the water soluble compounds as well as the alcohol soluble compounds for the whole four weeks that you have that tincture sitting in a jar um, steeping and you might be shaking it every day. You could absolutely chop it up and put alcohol over it or make um, a folk remedy. Like that would be more a uh, folk style. I like to do ratio because I make medicine for lots of people and I want it to have repeatable results, know what to expect, know what dosage to give. But if you're just making medicine for you know, yourself, um, you, it's totally fine to experiment and to just chop up a bunch of catnip as fine as you can, put it in a jar and cover it with alcohol. Um, I do recommend using that like higher proof, but if you have access to vodka, that's probably fine too you know, whatever alcohol, just 
the reason I say the high proof is because I don't want it to spoil on you. And if that vodka off the shelf has 60% water and there's a chance your um, blend, your tincture could get below 35%, at which point it's dangerously close to spoiling. So that's why for fresh extractions, I do like to recommend that higher proof. So you wait four weeks, you strain it out, you reserve that beautiful, bright green, dark, amazing tincture that smells so pungent. It smells so resinous, um, and it is. Um, and then if you want to take it, yeah, you're going to take one to five dropperfuls in water as needed specifically for the intestinal cramps. That's kind of my key use, but you can also blend it with other herbs. Um, for the sleepy time blend, I mentioned it's in my cramp support, um, but it's also in my good night blend. So I, it can definitely help with both of those things. It can be a very gentle sedative. So just a couple more notes about catnip. Um, it is said to have insect repellent effects. So I have not tested this personally, um, but I do intend to make a hydrosol this year to distill because it's the essential oil. So if I distill it in my copper still, I will get a hydrosol containing some of the essential oil that I can easily spray already diluted on myself. And hopefully it will have some insect repellent. Here's what, um, here's what I learned. So this was from, um, again, Southern Cross Plant Science Facility in Australia. Catnip essential oil was tested for larvicidal and repellent activity. Catnip proved to be effective as a topical repellent against several species of mosquitoes. However, when tested against DEET, catnip oil was not as effective. So maybe more effective than nothing, less effective than DEET. I'll experiment and let you know. Um, and I just have two more things to share. So some contraindications. Uh, the use of catnip is cautioned during pregnancy due to a slight amenagogue. That means that it brings on the menstrual period um, property. It's definitely not a strong amenagogue, but it has slight amenagogue properties um, and just a lack of research on its safety there. So cautioned um, and indicated against in pregnancy. It's also cautioned with people taking medication targeted at the central nervous system as reports have been issued indicating that Napita cataria has a potential psychoactive capability. I don't, I have never experienced that nor have I seen that, but I like to give um, wide contraindications just so you know. Um, oh, it's also, the use of catnip is also um, cautioned with medications that promote sleep because if you combine those herbs together, catnip might increase the effect efficacy of those sleep inducing medications. So just keep that in mind and you should be good. Um, and then I have one last note about catnip and this has to do with its name. The feline's attraction to this plant is curious indeed. And in fact, referred to as the catnip response. I'm reading this a quote actually from Mountain Rose Herbs. It is not just observed in domesticated house cats but also in jaguars, tigers, leopards, lions, and several other large cats. It elicits behavior such as chewing and head shaking, rolling around on the floor, and it even arouses their sexual desire. This response lasts from 15 minutes to one hour. They are responding to the scent of napetolactone in catnip, the ar ar aromatherapeutic element being more powerful than taking it internally. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and you know, good reason why people were always looking at me funny when I recommended catnip for them, since most people just know the whole cat thing. <laughs> and that is my presentation on the medicinal benefits of catnip. Beautiful, Geraldine. Oh my gosh. I could listen to you talk all day. Once a month, I will take it. <laughs> I love these sessions. Marcus has a wonderful question that I am really curious about also. Do you know which compounds give it that the medicinal effects? Yeah. I, so it is, I don't know the compounds off the top of my head, but I could look it up really quick in one of my 
reference books. I believe it's the um, one of the like linalool, one of those essential oils. It's, it's medicine is definitely coming from its aromatic properties mm. or the, the compounds that give it those aromatic properties. And maybe while you're looking it up, we have another awesome question. Any recommendations for organic high proof alcohol? Um, no. Your local distillery. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. I it's not certified organic, um, but if you are relatively, um, I imagine they ship it too. But Hollerhorn Distilling here in Naples, they have a beautiful. They call it Silver Leaf, um, and it's actually maple sap from Carl and Melissa's. <laughs> <laughs> their, their forest and they distill it into like a hundred proof <laughs> alcohol that um, they do very tasty cocktails with it and I'm just like thanks y'all this is what I make tinctures out of <laughs> so it's um it's definitely um on the more expensive side and it's definitely the realist of <laughs> of deals not certified organic but I can definitely tell you it's um, gorgeous straight from their wood lot and yeah everything that you would want from it organic and then some but what would you recommend Geraldine there must be other options I think that I think what you recommended is great I actually buy my alcohol in like a 55 gallon barrel and I haven't um bought it in a little while so it's it's like um pure I, I'm kind of like forgetting I don't do the ordering of that so so like Petra's recommend is, recommendation is better than mine um but I wanted to just circle back to the medicinal compounds question and it wasn't in my reference book however I know for a fact because I was just looking at it and that you can do an internet search of um like catnip even monograph and the first thing that you'll get are um you know like studies of catnip like um compounds you know what i mean They're less you're less going to get like herbals and you're more going to get scientific papers breaking down the constituents so that should answer your question <laughs> christina had a wonderful question too around um, muscle spasms and catnip what are your thoughts geraldine on the use of catnip for the relief of muscle spasms and in individuals with multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. what an amazing question that is an amazing question so catnip i would tend like i think it's more specific taken internally to um cramps like in your intestinal system and your reproductive system i think there are better herbs for topical spasming um and one of the things i think of first is um i had a client get really good relief from topical magnesium and internal magnesium the nutrient um the mineral but um there are some other antispas oh i think a really lovely antispasmodic herb i'm just thinking off the top of my head here but one i've seen like give people relief is kava kava root that's not local but it, it is a wonderful antispasmodic when applied topically and um hmm i'm it's not coming to me on the top of my head but i do have a whole list of herbs written somewhere that are antispasmodic topically and um, to offer that kind of relief. I'm thinking prickly ash keeps popping into my head, which I believe is a native tree. Um, and that can be nice in, an, in a formula externally for these kind of muscle spasms. Mm. Kava and magnesium are ones that I've seen work effectively, but it's not exactly a bioregional ingredient either way. Um, if you want to email me that question, Suntrap Botanical, at gmail.com, I would be happy to answer um, with my notes in front of me in greater depth. Um, oh, Marcus asked a question. I was also wondering if you know if cat mint is medicinal in a similar way. We have a lot of big plants in our beneficial insect plant strips, different species, but pretty similar morphology. I am so glad you asked because I have made, this is actually a funny story. My friend um, knew that I wanted a catnip tincture um, and he identified cat mint as catnip. And so we made a tincture of cat mint thinking he was making me catnip tincture and it worked beautifully. It worked beautifully. And so 
we like it and it actually did relieve um cramps it, it was actually like the medicine um that like really turned me on to catnip was this cat mint tincture and you know I've, I've used them interchangeably at times um but i haven't made nearly as much cat mint tincture and i meant to write down the species it's really hard to find because it's like i don't know there's like it's so many hybridizations or it's kind of a landscaping plant i don't know i wasn't able i I feel like I found the species before, but I don't have it committed to memory. Napita something. Mm. But yeah, go ahead and give it a try. I've, I've used the tincture. I, have def I haven't tried it as tea or anything and I haven't tried it that often, but it has worked for me before. Renee shares Twisted Path Distillery Vodka is organic and overproof, great for infusions. Awesome. Renee, can you share where Twisted Path is from? And I always love to mention too, when I'm purchasing Wisconsin, sweet, amazing, sending so much love to Wisconsin. I always love to mention when I'm purchasing um, materials from distilleries for medicine making that like, hey, PS, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> I'm making medicine out of this just so they know that oh there's a market for this <laughs> and maybe that's just uh my <laughs> on two cents often left field as well <laughs> like we can build other kinds of culture besides <laughs> with alcohol besides <laughs> Let's make cocktails culture. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Does anybody else have any burning catnip questions? This is the right crowd to ask. I mean. <laughs> or any personal stories also of how catnip has played into your life? Feel free to come off mute, please, and share. It's these personal stories that make it so real for all of us, all the more. <laughs> Susanna says, can you make small amounts of tincture if you don't have that much plant matter to work with? I have a little catnip and, but not that much. What yeah. do you think, Geraldine? Oh, I think certainly, definitely. Do you have a small jar? Because if you do, you can make some small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah go for it um i i totally make small tinctures sometimes if i just want want to make a small amount maybe it's like a plant i'm not really sure about and i don't want to make i mean the first time i make a tincture i'm usually going to just make a small amount because i don't really know um you know if i'm going to want to use that much and i don't want to waste materials so it's totally a great idea to make a small amount of cat mint tincture. Perhaps um, I will go ahead and read our, our quote again for our close. And certainly if anyone has any further questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat um, and a little, um, drum roll please we're about to talk next month about yarrow <laughs> i cannot wait um and dawn says is dried catnip best for tea anything else um and peggy wants to know geraldine does your apothecary still carry single tinctures and yay <laughs> um uh Don Reed, by the way, love you, Don. Hello. Um <laughs> dried catnip is great for tea. Yeah, I, I love using dried catnip for tea. Um, and that's you know, that's pretty much, I mean, besides giving to my kitties, like that's it. Um, using it in the tea blends, and then it's the fresh tincture. If I'm going to make catnip tincture, I pretty much just go, I make the fresh catnip tincture. And um as far as my apothecary carrying single tinctures, yes, we do. And Peggy, I got your email about this and I'm sorry, I haven't responded. I've just been in moving my apothecary, um, like just total chaos. And so my apothecary will be reopening this next week and hopefully 
by the following week, I'll be offering single tinctures again. Um, but I, I look forward to having that be more accessible. Peggy also asked about catnip in a foot soak or bath. I have never tried that, but I don't see why not. I think that sounds lovely. And please report back. I will also report back. Yeah. <laughs> well, feel free to drop any further questions, friends, into the chat. And without further ado, um, let's just touch back in with a little Robin Wall Kimmer. I think that the service berries show us another model one based upon reciprocity rather than accumulation, well, where wealth and security come from the quality of your relationships rather than the illusion of self-sufficiency. Without gift relationships with birds and bees, service berries would disappear from the planet, even if they hoarded all of their abundance, perching atop the wealth ladder, they would not save themselves from the fate of extinction if their partners did not share in that same abundance. Hoarding won't save us either, friends. All flourishing is mutual. Hoarding won't save us. Oh, save what does us. that mean? I can't hoard all of the catnip on the side <laughs> of my barn. Come, come now. <laughs> all flourishing is mutual, foot baths included. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. Geraldine, it's always such a joy. Kira, mm -hmm. you are absolutely remarkable. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Petra, Kira, and everybody for showing up today and just being part of this conversation. You know, part of it is we do it to be in community with you and it feels really good. Thanks. Till next time. We miss you. We love you. Let's talk soon. Let there be yarrow. <laughs> Let there be yarrow. <laughs>